late 1990s, Ken Thompson, co-creator of Unix, sits for an interview. His work forms the unseen foundation of countless system servers, phones, networks, and tools used daily. He's asked what he thinks of Linux, a system widely considered the modern successor to Unix. His reply surprises almost everyone. He calls Linux unreliable, says its code quality varies too widely, doubts it will hold up in demanding multi-machine environments. For a generation raised on Linux as the continuation of Unix, it feels like a quiet rupture. How did the architect of Unix become distant from the system that inherited its ideas? To understand, the story must move back through a childhood shaped by motion, an education shaped by logic, and a forgotten machine at Bell Labs, where a new operating system quietly began. Kenneth Lane Thompson was born in 1943 in New Orleans. His father, a Navy fighter pilot, moved the family frequently, base to base, city to city. The environment changed constantly. Amid that instability, Ken found refuge in structure. In grade school, he explored binary arithmetic and built circuits from hobby magazines. Radios, wires, and logic gates created miniature worlds where the rules stayed still. The family eventually settled long enough for him to finish school in California. He entered UC Berkeley, earning bachelor's and master's degrees in electrical engineering and computer sciences. Under mathematician Elwin Berlecamp, he learned the value of concise reasoning and clear constraints. By the time he joined Bell Labs in 1966, two traits defined him. He adapted quickly to external change. He preferred systems whose internal rules were minimal and consistent. That mindset soon collided with a vast corporate project called Multics. Multics was ambitious, an interactive unified computing environment designed to support many users and tasks elegantly. But ambition turned into complexity. Schedules slipped. Costs rose. Abstractions piled up faster than working implementations. Eventually, AT&T withdrew. Bell Labs reverted to older batch systems. Interactive computing once central became slow and fragmented again. For Thompson, trained to think in clean mechanisms rather than layered abstractions, this collapse wasn't just technical. It revealed a gap between the systems available and the systems he believed were possible. Yet the collapse left behind spare resources, machines and time no longer tied to official projects. It created space for experiments that didn't need approval. In a quiet corner of Bell Labs sat a DEC PDP-7, old, underpowered, and mostly ignored. Thompson had been developing a game called Space Travel on the mainframe. It ran slowly and cost money each time. Moving it to the PDP-7 made sense. While porting the game, he saw the outline of a larger idea. The machine needed a file system, processes, and small tools, components of a complete operating environment. Then came an unusual window. For about a month, while his wife and newborn visited family, Thompson worked long nights at the lab, assembling the pieces of a new system. There was no committee or product plan, just a researcher shaping a small, coherent operating system, one piece at a time. But before we continue this story, before we return to Bell Labs and the system that quietly reshaped computing, a quick word from today's sponsor. This video is supported by Brilliant. Brilliant focuses on something Ken Thompson cared deeply about, understanding systems, not memorizing outcomes. Instead of long lectures, Brilliant uses interactive lessons to teach math, computer science, programming, data analysis, and AI, where you actively solve problems step by step and see how ideas connect. If you're learning to code, their programming with Python course is a strong place to start. It's designed to help you build intuition for logic and problem solving breaking complex ideas into small, clear pieces the same way early programmers learn to think about computers. You start writing real programs immediately and you learn why things work, not just what to type. Right now, you can try everything Brilliant offers free for 30 days at brilliant.org slash code stories or by scanning the QR code on screen. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Thanks to Brilliant for supporting this video. Now, back to the system built in a quiet corner of Bell Labs. A colleague joked it resembled a stripped-down, single-user Multix, an on Multix. The name Unix grew from that joke. What began as a way to run a game became the foundation of a new operating system. To survive inside Bell Labs, though, Unix needed purpose. Thompson, Dennis Ritchie, and Rudd Canaday wanted a more powerful machine. A DEC PDP-11. But after Multix, requesting operating system research was politically impossible. They reframed the need. AT&T's patent department needed better text processing tools. A PDP-11 could support that. An operating system would be required to run the software, just as background infrastructure. 
management approved the purchase. Umix was ported to the PDP-11, expanded, and paired with Joe Asana's text formatter. Patent typists quickly adopted the system. It made revising long documents faster and easier. That real-world use quietly protected Unix. It was no longer a side project. A business process depended on it. Removing it would cause friction. A small, unofficial operating system had become part of the company's internal machinery. By the early 1970s, Unix had a distinct identity, a hierarchical file system, a handful of simple system calls, a shell built for composition, small, focused tools that communicated through text. It reflected Thompson's philosophy. Write small programs, unify interfaces, separate mechanism from policy, and rewrite rather than layer complexity. Inside Bell Labs, this approach became cultural. Teams built pipelines of tools instead of monolithic programs. Text became the universal interface. Outside Bell Labs, AT&T's legal constraints shaped Unix's future in an unexpected way. Because AT&T couldn't sell software as a product, it licensed Unix source code cheaply to universities. There was no polished distribution. Just tapes, documentation and the assumption that researchers would maintain their own systems. From that, a decentralized Unix community emerged. Universities brought Unix up on their machines, modified it, and shared improvements. User groups formed, bug fixes and new tools spread through informal channels. In Australia, John Lyons created an annotated commentary of the Unix kernel, an invaluable teaching resource. A TNT restricted its distribution, but photocopied versions circulated widely, becoming legendary among students and researchers. Inside Bell Labs, Thompson collected bug fixes between the 6th and 7th editions. AT&T blocked their official release. Yet a tape with those changes soon appeared in the Unix community. Corporate limits tried to slow Unix's spread. The community simply routed around them. Thompson didn't present any of this as resistance. It aligned with his instinct. Systems should be clear, functional, and shared when useful. Formalities mattered less than correctness. As commercial Unix grew, vendors expanded it. Siftum calls multiplied. Add-ons accumulated. Thompson saw the drift. He pointed out early Unix's lack of a clean model for remote resources and later fixes that felt inelegant. Meanwhile, Linux appeared. Linux re-implemented Unix-like ideas under an open license. Thousands of contributors added code. The system grew rapidly and unevenly. Thompson evaluated it the way he evaluated everything. Was it small enough to understand? Were its boundaries coherent? Was its design disciplined? From his perspective, Linux felt sprawling so he criticized it publicly. To many, it sounded like a feud between old Unix and new Unix. To Thompson, it was simply applying the same standards he had always followed. Today, Thompson's influence runs quietly through computing, in BSD systems and Mac OS, in servers and network infrastructure, in C compilers and development tools, in the culture of small, composable programs. His work extends beyond Unix, Plan 9. In Fermo, text processing tools, regular expressions, chess engines, and later research at Google. Through it all, he avoided becoming a movement figure. He stayed close to particular designs and to the idea that systems should remain small, clear, and comprehensible. The interview that opened this story isn't a contradiction. It is a continuation of a philosophy formed in childhood, sharpened at Berkeley, and expressed in Unix. Build systems you can understand. Let them grow only as far as they remain clear. And when they exceed that clarity, start again.